All right, here we go. So I will talk briefly about anticoagulation in COVID-19. Like a lot of, lot of um, issues related with COVID-19, you will notice there are more questions than answers, but I think it's good to have discussions on these topics. These are my disclosures. So COVID-19 is um, has a distinct coagulopathy associated with it, and it is um, marked by mild thrombocytopenia, just mild elevation of prothrombin time, elevated fibrinogen, sometimes markedly elevated levels. We've seen more than levels of more than 1,000 in some patients. Highly elevated D-dimers. Again, some patients in the ICU have uh, more than the upper limit of what can be measured as their D-dimer value. Uh, an increased risk of thrombosis, but overt DIC with a hyperfibrinolytic or bleeding phenotype is rare and just kind of limited to very late stage disease. And some studies have looked at what it means to have this coagulopathy. What they kind of to, uh, try to correlate outcomes with this, uh, the degree of coagulopathy. And many have shown that the degree of co coagulopathy directly correlates with outcomes, severe disease, ICU admissions, and death. What is the burden of thrombosis in this disease? So most, almost all, no, I should say all the data comes from observational studies. And most of the data, if you see in this table, comes from ICU population. And the risk of the rate of VTE ranges from 16% to 69% in this study from France, where they have a um, protocol of doing screening ultrasounds on all of their ICU patients. So if, they, if you go looking for it, then the rate is even higher than what has been reported in most observational uh, studies. And these two studies here, uh, Helms from France and Poesy also from France. They compared the rates of VTE they saw in their patients against a cohort of patients from the similar time from last year. And they noticed a significant difference in the rate of VTE in COVID population as compared to the other non-COVID ICU patients. There is also autopsy evidence of microthrombosis in patients with COVID-19. And I have quoted this study here, which I found interesting because they compared clinical findings with what they noticed on autopsy. And they no found that patients with unsuspected VTE, seven out of 12 patients had bilateral DVT. And they noticed that four out of seven actually died from PE. So this is a significant um, issue in patients with COVID-19. Now, what are the laboratory predictors of thrombosis? So this study looked at not only markers of coagulation, but also markers of inflammation. And I've only put the uh, parameters that they found significantly associated with thrombosis. If you will see fibrinogen, C-reactive protein, ESR, ferritin, these are markers of inflammation. And higher the, the levels, the greater the risk of developing thrombosis. So the point here is inflammation and thrombosis go hand in hand, which brings us to this center theory of thromboinflammation, uh, where thrombosis and inflammation, they are linked together in terms of the cells that initiate both of these, uh, linked together by the endothelium, which is both antithrombotic, which has both antithrombotic and anti-inflammatory properties. So when the endothelium we believe that endotheliitis and damage to endothelium plays a central role in both thrombosis and inflammation in many disease processes, as I had showed in previous uh, slide, and also in COVID-19. So when the endothelium is disrupted, it loses its antithrombotic and anti-inflammatory properties, meaning both the thrombotic and the inflammatory systems are uh, activated, which leads to um, damage from both the inflammation and thrombosis. Based on this, based on the data that I just provided, we came up with VTE guidelines for admitted COVID patients at Emory. And perhaps some of you have seen these guidelines and I'll just give you the highlights of that. Uh, we have stratified patients into levels one, two, and three to decide what level of anticoagulation to use for them. 
So patients with level one receive standard prophylaxis, and these are patients who do not have any known thrombus, and also their D-dimer level is less than 3,000. These patients receive just standard prophylactic dose um, anticoagulation to, throughout their admission and for a week post-discharge. Then level two patients is the intermediate dosing. This is patients who do not have a known thrombus, but their D-dimer level is greater than 3,000. And at this point of time, we are reviewing this level again to see if all ICU patients um, should fall in this level also, and that's being considered right now. So these patients get intermediate dose of uh, anticoagulation, which is equivalent to one milligram per kg of low molecular weight heparin per day, or a, a low standard heparin drip if the patients have renal failure. And level two patients continue to receive anticoagulation for four to six weeks post-discharge. Then level three is therapeutic dosing of anticoagulation. This is for patients who have known or suspected VTE or otherwise unexplained need for high oxygen requirement, refractory respiratory failure. And the rationale behind that is um, if you have concern that microthrombosis in pulmonary vasculature is responsible for refractory respiratory failure, then this allows you to use therapeutic anticoagulation for those patients. Um, and these patients receive anticoagulation post-discharge also, just like any of our provoked thrombosis folks would receive. So they receive anticoagulation for three months post-discharge based on that rationale. Now coming to outpatient management, right? What do we know about risk of thrombosis post-discharge? As you saw, most of the data that we have is from patients who are admitted to the hospital. And even out of that, most the bulk is for patients who have, uh, who are in the ICU, right? So there is this one study that was published recently who looked at, that looked at post-discharge risk of thrombosis. And this was a part of quality improvement study at King's College London. Um, where they have a policy of inpatient thromboprophylaxis only in COVID-19 patients, meaning no COVID-19 patients uh, with, with a, without any documented clot receive outpatient profi uh, prophylaxis or therapeutic dose anticoagulation. So after 1,877 discharges, they noted a post-discharge VTE rate of 4.8 per 1,000 discharges. And then they compared it with last year's discharges and they notice in the previous year, after 18,159 discharges, non-COVID discharges, their VTE rate was 3.1 per thousand. And the odds ratio for COVID-19 to control was 1.6, and it really was not significant. There is also another study that was presented at International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis Conference this year, which also noted low risk of post-discharge um, VTE in these patients. These are just two observational studies at this point of time, we don't believe this is practice changing, but definitely something we want to keep in mind um, as we um, you know, build our algorithms for outpatient uh, profile access. Then what is the risk of thrombosis in patients who are, not, who are managed just in the outpatient setting, right? And if you notice, really, my question occupies almost the entire screen here, because the thing is, it is, it is an active question. We do not have data on this question at all. And if we want to extrapolate data from inpatient setting, where we notice that degree of inflammation is what is related to the risk of thrombosis, then you would want to think patients who are not requiring admission probably do not have, carry the same risk of thrombosis as patients who are in the hospital or in the ICU. There may be some room for stratifying this based on patients' comorbidities, past personal or family history of thrombosis or thrombophilia, but really how to build an algorithm that will apply to all patients is still uh, difficult right now. Uh, we do not have data. And the answer really lies in clinical trials. And uh, we are actively trying to bring a clinical trial that is addressing this question where patients are um, randomized to either receiving prophylactic uh, DOAC versus placebo. Um, and I really believe clinical trials is the way to go to answer this question in this population. What do the guidelines say on this? 
there are some guidelines, um, societies that have addressed the question of post-discharge anticoagulation, where they have gone as far as saying consider post-discharge thromboprophylaxis for 7 to 45 days in patients who are considered to be at risk for VTE, high risk for VTE, but that is left open. It's quite subjective. For patients who don't require hospitalization at all, the only uh, society, I mean, uh, um, guideline that I found that has talked about it, touched upon this topic is NIH, where they say patients who do not require hospitalization, anticoagulants and antiplatelet therapy should not be initiated for prevention of venous thromboembolism or arterial thrombosis, unless there are other indications. And this is just strong expert opinion. That's all I have for you. And with this, I open the uh, forum for discussion. Dr. Gad, um, I just want to say thank you for, for reviewing that for us. Um, to, um, I guess, reflect back our experience briefly, um, and the reason that at VOMC, which is our virtual clinic, and ARC, we don't have um, routine recommendations about anticoagulation is we have not observed, just in our own experience, a high rate of VTE in outpatients. When we looked at 300 hospital discharges, early from March to April, I, I believe one patient had a post-discharge suspected VTE. And similarly, for our first 500 patients in the virtual clinic followed at home, I believe one patient was admitted and ultimately um, expired with suspected uh, VTE. So it, it does match our experience, but it's really useful to see the NIH uh, recommendation just to help sort of reinforce that we shouldn't be doing anything outside of um, uh, consultation with your service or uh, a clinical trial in the future, perhaps. So thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. It is really reassuring to hear that, the, you know, your real experience actually is... Uh, as it looks like there's one question in the chat um, from Catherine Park saying, can you show the level one slide again? Yes, sure. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. And Dr. Park, if you want to come off mute, do you have any specific questions about the slide? No, I just uh, wanted to see it because I kind of missed it. Thank you. Uh, Jim, it's David Prop. I have a question. For patients who have some risk and factors for If there are no other questions, I think we can turn it back to Dr. Uh, Thompson. I, I think, think David Kropp has a question. For, uh, speaking with us this morning. Go ahead, David. Uh, you have a question? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, for patients who have a risk factor, like maybe a factor five Leiden or a history of thrombosis, should, and they're outpatient, they're not inpatient, should we check a D dimer, not check a D dimer? or should we just call hematology on a case-by-case -case basis for consultation? Dr. Thompson? Uh, Dr. Gad, did you hear David Propp's yeah. question? Yes, Excellent. I did. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. At this point of time, you know, I will say, um, you know, based on rates that you've seen and the only guidance that we have available, it's best not to anticoagulate these patients. Um, the, as far as question about checking a D-dimer is concerned, I think a uh, lab value by itself um, should not be used in making decisions. Um, I will say combine, first thing to look at is the patient's condition. If you have any concerns about their overall status and you are in doubt whether the patient needs admission or not based on their clinical symptoms, I think that's a patient where D-dimer may have value because that will probably help you also decide whether the patient should be admitted or not, say if the D-dimer level is very high. But outside of that, if the, clinically the patient is doing fine, I believe at this time we do not really have anything to say uh, patients should be anticoagulated based on their past history. Then I'm not sure, um, I don't think I heard the answer and I apologize if I was distracted um, to the question about should we have high risk COVID patients take a low dose aspirin? Again, at this point of time for outpatient management, no, 
that is not, uh, we're not recommending that you take aspirin. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, I thank everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gad, and thank you, Jim, for coordinating. And I hope everyone has a safe and productive week. Take care. Thank you.